So we're going to continue continue our discussion on the conformal block. Um, this is for the ver um, the Virasoro conformal block for the sphere four point function. Um, and just recap where we were last time. Um, we're studying the four point function of uh, four primaries, um, and Virasoro primaries phi one, phi two, phi three, and phi four. Um, up to PSL two C transformation on the Riemann sphere, we can fix three of them to zero, one, infinity and one of them to be at the arbitrary point z. Uh, z is the conformally invariant cross ratio between the four points. Uh, and uh, from the point of view of radial polarization, we can represent this four point function in this way, uh, where we think of phi 1 as creating a state that evolves in the radial direction, and then you act on with two successive operators, phi 2 at z, phi 3 at 1, and then you take its um, overlap with a state uh, created by phi 4 at infinity. Um, and then we saw that uh, we can organize this into a conformal block expansion. The coefficients are the structure constants of the CFT. They are essentially the coefficients of the three-point function of primaries between, in this case, say, phi 1, phi 2, and the general primary, phi k. Uh, <coughs> um, and um, uh, here I've chosen the basis of primaries uh, to be orthonormal, uh, so that the two-point functions are normalized. And then the, uh, the Virasoro conformal block uh, I argued last time that it takes this form, where um, you can write it as an expansion in uh, powers of uh, the cross ratio z, or the position of phi 2 in this um, convention. Um, uh, so these, uh, you know, if you think about this power, is basically the, um, uh, let's say, for the term with n equals 0, uh, where n is n and m are partitions, and labeled the Virasoro chain. And uh, for the first guy, which corresponds to this at level 0, just the primary, the coefficient is just the OP coefficient of the primary in the OP of phi 1 with phi 2. Um, and uh, so here, uh, G upper AM is an inverse grand matrix um, that takes care of uh, inserting a complete basis of states. Um, uh, and these rows are essentially uh, three-point functions of, uh, let's say in this case, it's a three-point function between uh, nu 1, which is a primary of uh, just of with back to the uh, holomorphic part of the Virasoro algebra of weight h1. This is a primary weight h2. This is a primary of weight hk. But then you act on it with the Virasoro chain. This is at infinity. This inserted at zero. This inserted at one. That was convention for this row, and that strips off the op coefficients, which is why the op, op coefficient is sitting here. Yes. So why do you have these primaries new instead of just the phi's? You have uh, okay, this is just a notation. The notation of new is so that this number, just to emphasize that these numbers are universal. D these are determined by the Virasoro algebra entirely, has nothing to do with what CFT we're talking about. The only information about the CFT is contained in here. So new h, by definition, I guess I slightly abuse notation, new 1 is represent the primary state of uh, uh, appropriately normalized of uh, um, uh, weight h1. And by definition, the actual OP coefficient has been stripped off. So if you wish, you can say that here, uh, I pretend the structure constants were just 1. Okay, so in that sense, these are numbers that are completely determined, and it would be a good exercise for you to uh, calculate this as a function of the weights. Uh, any other questions? OK, so uh, now we're going to discuss um, uh, the properties of, uh, of these Virasoro conformal blocks. Um, and uh, as I said, you can uh, you know, use computer packages to calculate these rows explicitly as functions of the weights and central charge. Uh, but that's bec that bec becomes kind of a mess uh, beyond the first few levels. Um, so I'm going to tell you another way, uh, two other ways to think about these component blocks that will reveal some of its uh, nice properties that will become useful later. So um, uh, the, the first thing, one thing we're, we're going to discuss is the recursion relation due to Zemological. Recursion relations. 
Um, the idea is that, uh, uh, in fact, we can do recursion either in central charge or in the internal weight, but let me first discuss the recursion relation in the central charge. Uh, so the idea is the following. We want to uh, now, this, this guy viewed as a function of the central charge and all the weights and z, uh, we want to view it as an analytic function in c and then continue to the entire complex c plane. Um, now, so analytically continue uh, in C. Uh, what one finds is that, um, firstly, uh, there's a simplification uh, at uh, C equals infinity, in the C equals infinity limit. Uh, where, in this case, uh, in fact, um, the C equals infinity limit of this FC um, reduces to the global uh, SL2 component block. Uh, in other words, that's equivalent to say uh, um, to saying that we ignore uh, L minus two, L minus three, and so far uh, and so forth. We ignore all the higher order descendants and keeping only the L minus one descendants. So this equal to, is equal to uh, the global reduces to the global. SL2 block, um, in other words, keeping uh, only L minus 1 descendants. Um, and the answer for the global block is actually relatively simple, which is the hypergeometric function, um, 2F1. Uh, I just write this now. Uh, actually, I should write uh, H1, the da, and uh, H4, and H, internal weight H. So this is just h plus h2 minus h1, h plus h3 minus h4, 2hz. I won't derive this, but the derivation of this is elementary. OK, so uh, now uh, then it turns out that as an any function in C, so first of all, this thing behaves to, you know, it has a finite limit as C equals infinity, um, and it turns out to be a mer meromorphic function in C with simple, generically with simple poles. And the poles have uh, in interpretation. So uh, FC is meromorphic in C uh, generically with simple poles. Um, so the poles are actually at um, the simple poles at uh, C equals what I call C R comma S H. So what is this thing? I mean, let me define this. Um, last time, I said that um, for given center charge, the Virasoro algebra, you calculate the cast determinant it has, uh, as a polynomial. H has a bunch of zeros, um, which are h, which is not about h, r comma s. Those are functions of center charge c. So for given center charge, if the weight happens to coincide with one of these values, um, uh, the Virasoro representation become degenerate, there will be no state, there will be no descendants of this primary at level r times s. s. Remember, r and s are, non, uh, are positive integers. So CRS, I'm just turning this the other way around, um, if I want to take this, um, CRS is the value of central charge such that this given weight h happens to be one of the degenerate weights, namely HRS of that C. Okay, in other words, HRS of CRS of H is equal to H. That's the definition of CRS. <laughs> okay. Any questions about this? Hopefully that was clear. Um, okay, so uh, when, when this becomes a degenerate, um, uh, when, when C uh, is a value, goes to, is continued to a value at which H uh, is happens to de degenerate weight, um, uh, something funny happens because uh, uh, the gram matrix, recall, becomes the be, it becomes a de degenerate matrix uh, for these uh, weights H R S, um, and so if we continue C to those values, uh, this inverse gram matrix is going to have some poles. So that's where the poles come from. Um, and um, uh, just to analyze this a little bit more precisely, um, let's say. Um, um, uh, for the de degenerate primary, uh, uh, let me define notation. Um, 
So uh, before, uh, for h equals r s, h r comma s, um, the uh, there's a level r s in all states, uh, which I call in my notation. Uh, Uh, I wrote chi R S was sum over um, partitions of integer R S chi with some coefficient chi n R S L minus n nu H R S. So this represents abstractly the primary state. I said there are sort of chain act on it. These are coefficients, which are functions of central charge. Uh, functions of central charge, uh, well, in R and S, of course. Um, and uh, now uh, I'm going to define for uh, h, uh, what for general h, uh, let's say away from from h r s. Uh, I'm going to define the following: chi h r s is defined to be um, same thing and r s with the same coefficient. Uh, minus n new h. Um, and, and here, last time the normalization convention was that chi of the partition of just into all ones is uh, one. That, that was the normalization convention. Um, so uh, for general h, of course, this is now null state, not a null state, but in h goes to rs limit, it becomes a null state. Um, so uh, if you calculate the norm, well, in that part of this guy with itself, um, in the limit h goes over to h r s, uh, this generally has a simple pole, uh, sorry, simple zero, h uh, minus h r s, um, and times some number. This number, I'll, by convention, I'll write it as over a c r s. <coughs> so there's some finite uh, coefficient uh, times a simple zero. It vanishes in this way. Um, and uh, there exists a formula, so, so there's a uh, given by a known formula, uh, but uh, I'm not going to, I won't be deriving that formula, and I also uh, won't even bother writing down exactly what it is. Uh, but uh, it's in the lecture notes uh, that, that's posted. Um, it, it is, it's a standard, um, it, it's no quantity, it's, it's a function of central charge and R and numbers and R and S. Sorry? Uh, that's correct. The formula was a conjecture and was checked. But it has a nice form, so it looks convincing. Uh, no. Um, you can check that this expansion matches the. Oh, you, you just check uh, check in R and S up to some uh, number, and uh, and then you make a conjecture. Um, okay. Uh, um, so, um, oh, by the way, I should say that um, uh, clearly, if you uh, we in this limit when the state becomes null, if you act with a real sort of lowering operator with L n with for positive n. You're going to lower it to something, uh, but the lower ring operator will have to annihilate will have to annihilate this, um, and uh, in the limit h goes to h r comma s. So in fact, if you take l positive n, I count this r s. This will vanish also like vanish like h minus h r s, uh, and therefore if you rescale the state by um, one over square root of h minus h r s to make the norm uh, unity. Uh, in the h goes to h r s limit, then this thing still goes to zero. So in that sense, uh, uh, this chi, this, this null state, if you, you know, if you can take this limit and if you uh, keep the norm to be unity, uh, then they effectively behave like new primaries. And they, they behave like, like new primaries, but remember, the weight is not h r s. The weight is h uh, r s plus r s. So, in other words, just to, say, uh, just to summarize the, the conclusion, this behaves like uh, uh, weight uh, 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 behaves like a primary of weight 
h r s um, plus r s in the limit of h goes to h r comma s. Okay, uh, and then we said that uh, there's going to be uh, some poles in the grand matrix coming from uh, the uh, null uh, descendants. Uh, this for h equals h r s. This was the first null descendant, a level r s, and then you have you can act on it further well, L, with L minus n, with some further sort of chain that creates uh, more null descendants at even higher levels. Um, but as I said, for this purpose, in fact, this thing itself behaves like, uh, or this chi rs itself, uh, behaves like a, um, a primary state. So uh, all the null descendant uh, that arises in the h goes to hr limit can be thought of simply uh, as states in the virtual representation generated by this primary. Uh, so those will give rise to uh, the um, uh, uh, the poles in this inverse square matrix, and um, so uh, let me now write a, a so we can write a formula for uh, what the residue uh, is for this conform block at that pole. So in fact, uh, for this purpose, it's uh, maybe slightly easier to first think in terms of uh, um, instead of taking the limit of c goes to crs, let's fix c and take the limit h goes to hrs. It's uh, they're closely related, as we said. Uh, so let's take this limit h goes to hrs, um, h minus hrs times the whole block, uh, and let's say h for h4 uh, depend on h which is internal weight, z. Uh, so this now becomes um, um, a c r s coming from the inverse grand matrix. It will be the term involving inverse of this. Um, sum n equal to m. The same factors of z that comes along with the right, plus h r comma s, r s uh, plus n. And we have the rows, new 4, new 3, uh, L minus N, chi R S. Um, let me first write write this down and then make some comments. G N S C H R comma S plus R S Rho L minus M Chi R S U two new one. So what did I, what did I do here? I'm taking H equals to H R S limit and I said that the only contribution that's gonna survive when multiplied by this vanishing factor um, come from uh, the null descendants in other words, now the descendants of chi R S, which itself can be viewed as a primary. What is the weight of that primary? The weight of that primary is H R S plus R S, uh, which is uh, also this one here. Okay, so the divergent part of the inverse grand matrix is just one over just this pole factor times the inverse grand matrix of now descendants uh, of descendants of chi R S. Uh, and uh, likewise, since I can regard Takao as, as a primary, the, um, the coefficient, uh, these uh, three point fun function coefficients rho, is just the three point function between a pair of primaries, which are external primaries, and uh, now level n descendants of chi R S. I should say, emphasize that this, maybe I should use a slightly different notation, but this n and m are not the same as n and m over here. Those n and m. Uh, so these n and m are level r times s more than those n and m. In that. I hope, hope that's clear. <laughs> Any questions about this? Yeah. Uh, uh, you're asking how do I see that? Uh, well, it's actually not always true for Virasoro, general Virasoro conform blocks. I will tell you later that for higher genus conform block, this is not true. They, they differ by a little bit. So, so that's not a trivial statement. So in this case, you can prove it directly. Uh, I mean, the, um, the, uh, uh, but I, I, th I think uh, maybe the intuition will be become slightly more clear uh, when I tell you the more general statement, uh, which can be physically understood in terms of uh, uh, ADS-CFT duality with uh, pure gravity in ADS-3. So that's some way to understand from, from that perspective. Uh, but the general statement is actually that um, the sequence infinity limit of this will uh, be equal to, up to a conformal anomaly factor, the uh, sequence infinity limit of the vacuum block times, um, uh, times the global SL2 block. 
Uh, and the vacuum block happens to be trivial in this case. Oh. Uh, good. Any other questions? Um, all right. Uh, so we are uh, almost there. So uh, I just have to tell you uh, one more piece of ingredients, uh, which is actually elementary to, to show that, um, let's say, this row of L minus N chi Rs mu2 mu1, which is a three-point function. Uh, so you can think of this as, let's say, mu2 mu1 sitting at 0, mu2 at 1, and this descendant chi Rs at infinity, this kind of three-point function. So this you can think of as taking a bunch of uh, uh, contour integral of the stress and the tensor multiplied by appropriate powers of z uh, into the contour integral. So this act on the thing at infinity. But you can deform the contour to act on either 0 or 1 and use the OPE of the stress and tensor with these primaries and just reduce this. So these numbers can be calculated in that way. And it's elementary to prove that um, uh, by some kind of induction, that this is in fact uh, has a factorization property uh, that is is equal to um, uh, um, ah b before that let me say that um, chi R S was still remember it was still this now descendant over here even though its inner product with itself is equal to zero in the limit h goes to h R S. Um, the three-point function is actually not zero with two ge other generic primaries. So that's exactly why the uh, Kamo block itself will blow up. OK, but uh, this is not zero. It's actually some finite number. And uh, that finite number is, uh, uh, is just this. You can, uh, there's a factorization property where you can just think of replacing this by a primary of the same weight, uh, with namely nu hrs plus rs, nu to nu1, and then times the row of um, chi r s itself, u2, u1. OK? Uh, so this is elementary to prove, but I, I, I don't have time to prove that on the board for you. But by using this kind of counter argument, it's easy to see why this is true. It's a, it's a simple exercise that you, you, should, you can do. Um, so if I do this, uh, then um, you see, I have some uh, now some uh, universal factor that is common to all terms in the sum. Um, if I ha if I replace this row by this row, uh, you see that I have just the conformal block for shifted internal weight, uh, where HRS is now shifted to HRS plus RS. Um, and this factor is just multiplying the whole thing, um, and um, uh, this quantity. Let, let's just say that it is also no. There's a formula for this. Again, I don't want to write down this formula because I want to write it for you, and uh, it will just take too long to write. But, uh, uh, but that thing is no. Um, it's, it's expressed in terms of something called the fusion polynomial. Anyway, I won't. Um, uh, it's, it's in the lecture notes that's posted. Um, and uh, so to summarize, uh, uh, what this tells us is that it actually determines um, the residue uh, of the conformal block as h goes to h uh, r s. So the limit uh, h goes to h r s um, of h minus h r s, uh, this, all this stuff, um, is uh, equal to um, uh, some known factor. I won't write what, what it is explicitly. Uh, this known factor is basically this a c r s times uh, this row and also another row from the other row factor. Um, some known factor times the conformal block, uh, where the internal weight, uh, so the, here, this depends on some internal weight h and depends on z. Uh, here, the weight, internal weight h, which on the left hand side was taken to the hrs, is now shifted to hrs plus rs. Okay, so. Uh, if you view this as a fun function in H, you will have poles with this residue. And the residues are conformal blocks with shifted weights. And the reason this is going to be useful is because the shifted weights, conformal block with shifted in internal weights, just, just a second, uh, starts at the higher power of z. So you'll be pushing our ignorance to, to higher order in the, in the z expansion. So, so um, by repeating a, um, this kind of recursion formula, we'll be able to 
uh, this algorithm will terminate uh, if you are interested in figuring out the coefficient and you find the power in Z. Yes? How do we know that this new HRS plus RF exists? I don't need to know if it exists. It, this is an abstract representation of, uh, uh, this just indicates a primary state in the representation of various sort of algebra. This has nothing to do with, with CFT, with what CFT we're talking about. So everything written here is completely universal to any to representation of various sort of algebra. It has nothing to do with the particular conformal field theories. The only thing on these blackboards so far that has to do with specific conformal field theory are these two coefficients oh, sitting over there. Everything else is universal. Yes? I apologize. I know you probably already answered this, but what's the difference between the term on the left-hand side and the first term on the right-hand side? Uh, sorry, uh, which question? That one. This one? Yeah. So uh, that's supposed to be just a generic primary that's not null? HRS plus RS? The, uh, correct. And so on the left hand side, we have a primary that is null that has wait, HRS plus RS. Uh, well, even though I said this thing behaves like a primary, uh, is, I haven't normalized this property, right? So, so the definition of this guy is this. It's a d itself is a d no descendant. I'm just saying that you know if you calculate this by the standard rule of these world identities, like by this counter definition argument, the answer you get will be this. It will be this one, which is not equal to one. If all three primaries are, oh, if all three are actually primaries, there, this row is defined to be one. That was my convention because I said I stripped off any possible weak coefficients. Right. So, but this is not one. So, if if chi R S were a primary, uh, this is a tautology. Okay. Good. Any other questions? Um, okay. Uh, now. Um, if FOC viewed as function of h would have posed over here, and uh, these are also uh, where the, 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 the same mechanism give rise to the pose in the center charge, and uh, if you view this as a function of c, you, you see obviously this also give rise to uh, pose in c. Uh, the residue in c and the residue in h differ by a factor, which is just the derivative of this function with back to c. Okay, uh, so uh, uh, to summarize, uh, the, uh, and, and of course, uh, if we have a Marmot function with simple pose, uh, actually there are infinitely many uh, distributed on, on the entire complex C plane, and uh, then if you know the residue of the pose, you know the behavior function at infinity uh, through the global block, then you determine this function. So, uh, so the conclusion is that F C, um, uh, well, uh, is equal to um, uh, global block. I'm just writing words, global block. I mean, the formulas you know, can be written down uh, explicitly uh, in the lecture notes, but uh, I don't want to just write out everything on the board. Uh, plus uh, sum over uh, R and S. So it turns out that if you look at recursion in C, the restriction is R is greater than or equal to 2, S greater than or equal to 1. The reason for this is because H11 is always 0. That does not give rise to any pole in C, even though it gives rise to pole in H. Um, and you have 1 over. C minus CRS, which is a function of internal weight. Uh, and then you have some residue. So uh, there, again, there's some no, no factor, which I won't write. That's a function of uh, the external weights. Uh, in this case, it's a function of the external weights and the sum of charge. The dependence on the exter external weights come from this. Um, then times, uh, times uh, the conform block with C evaluated as CRS and with h uh, shifted by r times s. Okay, so that's the recursion formula. And uh, let me just say again, the reason this uh, recursion formula is useful is because um, the, the, this weight is shifted to higher. And the, if the internal weight is higher, it starts at a higher power in the z expansion. OK. Uh, any questions so far? Uh, so th this is essentially the way we uh, in practi practically calculate these various sort conform blocks. But actually, that the the, this recursion formula is not the most efficient uh, recursion for the case of uh, formula for the case of sphere four-point blocks. Um, and uh, uh, let me tell you something that's better. And to explain uh, to explain that, um, I will need to uh, change. Uh, the variable z to a different variable that actually is very, very useful for illustrating the analytic properties of the various sort conform blocks. So, 
So uh, if I consider the, these four operators phi one, phi two, phi three, phi four, um, suppose I view these. Uh, consider the following mathematical construction. Um, I have a. Uh, uh, I can consider a torus um, that is a twofold branch cover over the Riemann sphere branch over four points. Um, that torus is going to, so let's say these are 0, z, 1, and infinity. Uh, then the covering torus uh, will have a, a modulus tau, um, which is, uh, uh, so is a 2 to 1, 2 to 1 covering map. Um, uh, tau will be a function of, uh, the function of z. And um, we can write this function uh, is, in fact, i times k one minus z over kz, where k is a elliptic integral, which in this case is a, a hybrid geometric function, to f1, one half, one half, one z. Um, the details of that uh, does not matter at the moment. Um, so um, now, um, uh, from that perspective, we can actually uh, think of the Riemann sphere uh, as uh, a z2 quotient of the torus. This is the standard thing. You take the torus to z equals to minus uh, z reflection. The quotient uh, is topological sphere. Uh, but of course, if you start with the flat torus and do this quotient, you'll get something that doesn't quite look like a uh, sphere because it's not round. So it has some corners. Uh, so this is geometry. We call it the pillow. Um, so, so let me draw a picture to illustrate um, what's going on here. Uh, in fact, we can a, a different an equivalent way to say this is that we can actually perform a conformal transformation uh, of the uh, Riemann sphere to turn it into a, a pillow geometry. This pillow is just basically you think of a parallelogram uh, on the top and another one, another copy at the bottom, uh, kind of glued together along their boundaries, uh, and uh, and the four points are zero, z, one, and infinity. OK, so uh, and um, uh, if you want to kind of straighten up this, this pillow, you have to have obviously have the corners over here. Uh, and uh, the modulus, uh, so the, the, per the modulus of this parallelogram is precisely uh, this uh, tau parameter uh, for the covering torus. Um, in fact, we can, I can write a slightly more explicit map if you want to. Uh, um, uh, uh, it's just to be uh, completely explicit. Uh, let's say uh, let's say I parameterize this coordinates by u, since I already use z here, um, and let me uh, parameterize the coordinate over here by w in this uh, uh, torus coordinate flat torus coordinate system. Uh, then w is related to u uh, by the following formula: one over theta function of tau squared. This is just normalization: zero to u. Uh, dx over square root of uh, x, one minus x, z minus x. So it takes the form of some elliptic integral. OK. So um, uh, the reason that this is a useful thing to do is that now I have operators phi 1, 0, uh, phi 2 inserted here, phi 3 inserted here, and phi 4 I'm inserted at infinity. So I think of. Uh, so here, I've inserted the, the operators originally on these four points on the Riemann sphere are now on the four corners of the pillow. So I can think of this pillow as um, computing some kind of uh, overlap of uh, two states. One state is created by these two, uh, phi 1 with phi 2. They create a state uh, on the circle over here. The cross-section of the pillow is topologically a circle. Uh, and I evolve this uh, using the Hamiltonian of the CFT. And then I take its overlap with the states created by phi 3 and phi 4 on the two other corners of the pillow. Uh, from this uh, point of view, uh, I would expect that um, the, uh, let's say, the coercion function in the pillow geometry of the CFD on the pillow with the operators inserted at the cor corner should take the following form. It should be, um, uh, in fact, for now, let me, since I'm talking about conformal blocks, I'm just going to keep track of the holomorphic uh, dependence. Um, um, uh, there, 
the state created by uh, five, 4 and 5, 3, and the state created by 5, 1 and 5, 2, exactly what the states, what states these are, I don't yet know. Uh, they are determined by whatever conformal transformation you need to do to go from the Riemann sphere to the pillow. Um, and then there's a propagator, which is Q to the L0 minus C over 24, where here Q is equal to E to the pi i tau. Uh, oh, sorry, I think I forgot to say one thing. Um, uh, I said this pillow is a, uh, is a Z2 quotient of the torus. So the torus is this, at do a quotient, uh, this part is the pillow. So I'm folding this backwards, so that was a pillow. So in the pillow geometry, um, I, in the pillow coordinate in W, this corresponds to W equals zero, W equals pi, this is W equals pi tau. Um, so because that's a factor two here, I write this, my Q here is e to the pi i tau, not e to the two pi i tau. And that's just a convention. Somehow it's a convention that got stuck in this context. And this Q has a name. It's called the elliptic norm. Uh, in fact, it's, uh, in Mathematica, there's even a function just for this Q called the elliptic norm. So if you want to compute this in Mathematica, you just use the built-in function elliptic norm. Uh, actually, it's called ellipt elliptic norm Q <laughs> with precisely this convention. Um, Okay. Um, now, actually, this thing um, is not quite the same. Uh, so uh, the idea is that um, in the OPE of phi one with phi two, I want to uh, uh, look at only uh, the descendants of a particular primary, uh, whichever primary it is, is uh, is the one that I want to study the conformal block of. Uh, uh, but of course, the state created by phi one and phi two will include that uh, primary and all of, in principle, all of his descendants with some appropriate coefficients. Um, the overall coefficient, which is the OP coefficient, again, I strip off. So this psi one two here uh, just represents um, uh, the superposition of all the primary, uh, of all the descendants of a particular primary in the OPE of phi one with phi two, stripping off the co coefficients once again. So I want to use this to, as a way to represent the conform block, but in the pillow frame. Now it turns out that to go from this, go, go from the red sphere to, to, or the complex plane to this, um, there's a non-trivial conformal transform involved, which in introduces a conformal anomaly. So actually, this thing uh, that I want to write is not strictly uh, speaking equal to the uh, conformal block, what they call Ft, but differed by a conformal anomaly factor. Um, I won't derive this conformal, this anomaly factor. Uh, it was uh, uh, was actually first known by Zamlogikov in the. 80s in a different language, but it was derived in a very uh, nice way uh, in a more recent paper by Malasena, um, uh, David Stevens Stephen, and Sasha Zibuedov. Uh, so I'll just tell you the answer uh, for that. Uh, uh, oh, before I uh, get to that, let me uh, write one more thing. Uh, this thing here, we can write it as a sum. Uh, for the reason I said, uh, I'm only keeping track of the descendants of a uh, primary of weight h. So this will involve q to the uh, h plus n minus c over 24, n sum from little n sum from zero to infinity with some coefficients a n. The coefficient a n will depend on the external weights as well as the central charge. So the H you're keeping track of here is just the same internal leg you wanted in the... Uh, yeah, yes, it's, it's the same as this HK okay. that I want to keep track of, yes. Um, good. Um, okay. Um, uh, now this representation has some, nice, has some advantage. For example, uh, if uh, 3 is the same as 2, and if 4 is equal to 1, then this... Um, uh, then it's clear that A n are actually uh, 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 non-negative coefficients because they are essentially inner products of. Uh, uh, if, if you take say tau to be purely imaginary, and if you take two to be, th if you take two to be three, one to be four, and then uh, this A n's are just inner products, uh, uh, are just the norm squared of, uh, just norm of uh, um, some states, and uh, provided that the limitations are all uni unitary, uh, the coefficients must be positive. Right, so this AN has some nice positive properties, which would not hold for uh, generic kind of coefficients of Z expansion of the conformal block. Uh, H, 
Uh, H, H is the H is in, turn, is in the conformal block. So, so here, I'm not writing the actual four point function. What I'm saying is that um, if you were to compute the four point function by taking the OPE of phi 1 and phi 2 at the two corners and just uh, keep the descendants of a primary of weight H, um, that contribution, the holomorphic part of that contribution is given by this a formula like this. For some uh, state here, by writing the state, I just mean some specific uh, linear combination of all very short descendants of a primary of weight H. That is all. So this is supposed to be the same as conformal block, but in a different conformal frame. And two conformal frame are related, but the answer of a conformal block differed by a conformal anomaly factor. So uh, I'll just write down the formula for this. Uh, so the actual conformal block of this, which is function of Z, depending on H and depending on Z, is equal to uh, equal to this guy here, the, the block in the payload geometry. Uh, with a prefactor, uh, that is theta 3 of tau, this Jacobi theta function, C over 2, minus 4 H1 plus, plus H4, the external weights, and uh, times, uh, right now space here, times Z to the uh, C over 24, minus H1, minus H2, 1 minus Z to the power C over 24, minus H3, minus H4. Uh, the main thing I want to point out here is that uh, this prefactor depends only on the center charge C and the external weights. These have nothing to do with internal weights. The reason is because they come from a conformal uh, anomaly. Okay. Um, now, um, it turns out that um, uh, this, this guy here, um, th this guy here, um, has a, uh, a very simple large H limit. So in the infinite, uh, in the infinite internal weight limit, uh, this thing simplifies. Um, I won't prove this to you, but I'll give you some intuition. Yes? Uh, no, first of all, this has nothing to do with modular invariance. I'm still talking about sphere four point function. Uh, it is true, on the other hand, the payload geometry makes crossing symmetry uh, uh, in some sense maybe more obvious in that crossing symmetry just corresponds to rotating the payload by 90 degrees in the case of a square pillow. Um, but this a has nothing to do with modular invariance, even though there's some mathematical analogy. We're not doing the torus at all, right? We're not doing the torus. We're still on the sphere. Uh, okay, uh, but as you see, the, you know, a lot of a uh, lot of the language in, that we use in studying Camo field theory on the torus uh, is relevant here. And um, okay, so uh, in the large H limit, this turns out to simplify. It turns simplify into the following: uh, becomes 16 Q to the power H minus C over 24 uh, product H equals one to infinity. Uh, 1 over 1 minus q to the 2n to the power 1 half. Okay. So what is going on here? Uh, ignore the 16 for, for now. The 16 is actually because you, the normalization of the uh, conformal block, the leading coefficient. Uh, but ignore 16 for now. Um, what this thing is, is basically uh, the square root of the torus character of a, uh, uh, of a uh, primary of weight h. So if you had to double this pillow into back into a torus, um, the torus Q will be this Q squared because of this, uh, I guess I erased that. Uh, Q is now pi i tau. So Q squared is e to 2 pi i tau. Uh, so that's why I had 1 over 1 minus Q to the 2 n. So the, the, this 1 half is because, so if I first double this, I have twice of the pillow, uh, I will get roughly, very roughly speaking, I will get the torus, and I get the torus character, but I only have one copy of the pillow, so I take the square root of that. That's basically this answer after coefficients. Uh, we can uh, discuss in more detail uh, uh, why this limit is, is correct. Uh, roughly, the intuition is that um, uh, the torus can really be realized as the, um, uh, the full point function, well, the pillow with the four operators inserted on the, on the corner. The operator you have to insert are some um, Z2 twist fields uh, of the twofold uh, product uh, CFT. But uh, in the large internal weight limit, that uh, insertion of the uh, twist field can be ignored. Th th that's, that's roughly where what is the intuition for this. Um, OK, so, uh, uh, so now, uh, actually, this is great, because 
Um, it tells us that uh, if once you strip off this prefactor, which is a simple known prefactor, and uh, the rest of the conformal block, uh, we know the large H limit now, which is very simple. And we also know, uh, again, is the residues at the poles in H, which are at H RS, just like how I de derived the recur recursion relation earlier. So there's another recursion relation. Instead of recursion, doing the recursion in, uh, in C, we do the recursion in H, um, provided that and knowing this um, large H limit. Uh, OK, so the formula is too long to, uh, to, 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 to repeat, so I'm not uh, going to write, write that H recursion formula explicitly. Uh, but I want to comment on the importance of this uh, parameter Q. OK, so um, uh, you might think that uh, so far this Q is just some arbitrary parameter I introduced um, to look fancy. but um, uh, in fact, um, it's a good idea to think about uh, to think of the sphere four point variable conformal block as a function of Q rather than in Z. And here's why. Um, so um, after stripping off this prefactor, the Q expansion, as I said, uh, let's say in a special case uh, where two, three is equal to two and four is equal to one, this provision A ns are positive. So if I know that um, let's say if I know the sum over powers of Q converges for, uh, uh, let's say, some um, uh, real number, uh, for some positive real number Q, uh, it would converge on the, on the disk, uh, uh, on the complex Q plane, uh, whose radius is that real number. Um, so uh, what values would Q take? Well, Q, remember, was e to, e to the pi tau. So it actually takes value on the unit disk. So, uh, um, the complex Z plane, the conform block is a function of Z, um, well, singular, a priori singular at zero, uh, because of OB singularity, but that's a very simple type of singularity. It will be singular at one as well as infinity, and in fact, there's a branch cut going from one to infinity if you try to only continue that conform block. Um, a priori, so far, everything we have said um, uh, is such that viewed as expansion powers of Z, the radius of convergence is unity. That's because you're running a singularity as equals one, um, where the operator, you know, phi two coincides with phi three. Um, but um, uh, you can ask if you take this entire z plane, map it to the q disk, uh, do you get the entire q disk? And the answer is no. Uh, so this is the unit q disk. That is uh, on the boundary here, q mod is equal to one. So uh, the map is such that z equals zero is still mapped to q equals zero, um, but um, uh, and z equals one is actually mapped to q equals one, and z equals infinity is mapped to q equals minus one, um, and this entire branch cut is mapped to a curve like this uh, on the q disk. If you approach from above, if you approach from below, um, you, that branch cut is mapped to this curve down here. And in fact, the entire complex Z plane uh, module the, you know, away from the branch cut is mapped to this I-shaped region on the Q-disk, but not the entire Q-disk. In particular, uh, I should use some color chalk, maybe. Uh, uh, in particular, um, this line over here, between 0 and 1, for real values of Z, is mapped to uh, this line over here for Q uh, between 0 and 1 and real. Um, and uh, if I know the conformal block, uh, well, if I know that uh, the Q um, expansion converges uh, over here, in particular for Q very close to 1, which it is, uh, then it will converge on the entire Q disk because of the positivity of the AN coefficients. And therefore, I conclude that the conformal block, the virtual conformal block as a function of Q, is actually analytic, analytic on the entire Q disk. It will have sing essential singularities along the boundary, but let's not worry about that. So, the, uh, so in other words, FC, uh, regarding the function Q, is analytic on the entire Q disk. Now that is very powerful because it tells you not only how to compute the sort of conform block for arbitrary Z, it also allows you to know how exactly to, uh, to continue this uh, across branch cut to other sheets. 
Yes. Uh, this is stronger than that. Uh, you're talking about the raw coordinate for, for uh, usually people write for global blocks. This, this is stronger than that. Uh, it, it's special for your sorrow global block. And this in particular depends on, uh, th this construction involves the finiteness of some charge C. If you take a sequence to infinity limit, this doesn't quite work, as, uh, as I stated. So it's actually important for this that the central charge is finite. And we're talking about the full your sorrow global block. Well, in some sense, that's where all the magic of the Versoro symmetry comes in. Yes. Well, uh, I just cross over here. No, it does not go back. It doesn't go back. There's no simple monogamy relation. Uh, you want to go across the branch count and go back to zero. Uh, well, uh, I don't know. I think it'll land, land somewhere else on the Q-disk. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it'll just map to the other point on the Q-disk. Right. I, I, I think there's... Uh, no, actually, I think in the paper by Molasina, uh, Simon Stuffman, and Jibredov, there's some nice plots of other domains. I think it's either in that paper or in maybe more recent paper by Kaplan and friends. But you can draw more lines than get every sheet. Yeah, yeah, there, there'll, there'll be infinitely many sheets, yes. You get closer and closer to the boundary. Good. Um, okay. Um, uh, furthermore, uh, this expansion, uh, well, uh, so now, uh, uh, okay, so, um, because of this uh, simplification large H limits, you can also understand the convergence of OPE, because, um, uh, after that prefactor, if you write the full point function as decomposition to the sum of a, of a conform blocks, uh, roughly speaking, you have some OP coefficients of, uh, uh, let's say, some of internal weight. Uh, I'm being schematic here because I don't want to keep writing left and right weights and, and all that. So uh, roughly, ha you have some OP coefficient squared. Let's say, suppose that all the four external operators are identical. So you have some OP co coefficient squared. You have some FC uh, that depends on, on internal weight. Um, and uh, after some prefactor in the large large internal weight limit, this thing is going to go like some prefactor times uh, Q, 16Q to the delta. Um, so, uh, and the coefficients uh, up to the prefactor, uh, you know, it'll it, it go like this, um, uh, by virtue of this, this, uh, this is the simplification in the large internal weight limit, um, and therefore, and this coefficient is supposed to be positive, and this quantity is supposed to be convergent, uh, for Q approaching 1, and if it's convergent for uh, Q approaching 1, it would be convergent everywhere. And uh, furthermore, uh, to ensure that this thing converges, you know the OPE coefficient squared uh, cannot grow too fast. So if this thing goes like 16 Q to the delta, uh, C delta uh, must fall off, falls off uh, uh, at least uh, as fast as 16 to the minus delta. Uh, and therefore, if you evaluate this whole four-point function at anywhere in the in interior of the Q-disk, uh, the convergence is exponential. So the statement, to summarize, the statement is that OPE actually converges exponentially fast. Yes? So if I just let h equals zero here, this turns into the usual eta function I'd expect for the vacuum block. So why do we need the h goes to infinity limit? Is that just to restore... No, 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 no. The, this, this guy, um, in general, is not equal to this. It's, it, it goes over to this in the h equals okay. infinity limit. Yeah, yeah, I mean, this is a, a very complicated thing. That's why we need the recursion relation to calculate this. Sure. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, all right. So now I'm uh, uh, going to get to something, uh, some actual results. Um, and let's see. Um, a given four-point function, um, as already mentioned, on the sphere four-point function, uh, can be decomposed, say one, two, three, four, can be decomposed in different conform block channels. Uh, so it can take, uh, actually, let me read what are these things around. 
okay, one, two, three, four. So you can either decompose into uh, in the compose blocks in one, two, three, four channel, which is what I've been writing there, or I can decompose in another channel, let's say uh, one, four, uh, into two, three, and also there's a third channel. Uh, now, of course, the consistency of CIT requires these two to be equal, um, which is, uh, as I stated earlier, equivalent to the associativity of the OPE. Uh, but now, if we actually look at the formula, uh, that puts non-trivial constraints on the OPE coefficients. Um, so let me uh, discuss, um, okay, so okay, let me write down some formula. So basically, uh, uh, in my convention here, the points are at uh, 0, z, 1, and infinity. Um, so uh, this thing is basically uh, sum over uh, c for 3k, c k to 1, um, some control block uh, as a function of z and z bar. It's very like this, actually. Let me just call it f will depend on uh, hk and hk tilde. Um, sum over k. Uh, which is supposed to be equal to, in this case, I'm just switching um, uh, z to 1, uh, I'm essentially switching uh, uh, 0 and 1, uh, and that is equivalent to uh, taking uh, z to 1 minus z. So this is still z, now the 0 now becomes 1. So this is basically c, uh, uh, I'm switching, uh, let's say, uh, 1 and 3. So 4, 1, k, c, k to 3. Um, F, I mean, I can call this k a different index if I wish, wish but it doesn't matter. Hk, hk tilde, uh, 1 minus z, 1 minus z bar. So this is called the crossing equation. And it puts very non trivial constraints on these OPE coefficients. Um, so I'm going to uh, discuss now uh, two non trivial solutions to the crossing equation. Okay, um, so um, solution, uh, so uh, well, let's say sample solution one. Um, uh, I'm going to look at the case C equals one half. And uh, uh, this is one of the mirror models. Um, so in this case, uh, as I mentioned before, there are um, uh, the primaries have to take the degenerate values of the weights h11, uh, h12, h21. Uh, it turns out that um, there's a CFT uh, uh, that involves three non-trivial virtual primaries, and only three in this case. Uh, they are identity operator, uh, and uh, a field I call sigma, another field I call epsilon. Um, all of these are going to be scalar primaries in this case, that which means uh, h and h tilde are equal, which is equal to h11 for this case, h11 is equal to 0. For sigma, h h tilde also equal, because h12, which is turns to be 1 over 16. And in the case of epsilon, h and h tilde are equal to uh, 1 half. So I have three operators, one is identity, I have sigma and epsilon. Uh, they're both of their holomorphic and anti-holomorphic weights are 1 16th and 1 half. Um, so I'm going to discuss the four point function of sigma field. 0, z, 1, and infinity. Um, now, sigma, in this case, because I'm going to take advantage of the fact that it has a null descendant at level 2. Uh, so in fact, it's very easy to actually uh, figure out what this null descendant is by looking at the level 2 grand matrix. So that is actually equal to the null state is L minus 1 squared minus 3 quarters L minus 2. So this act on sigma must be equal to 0, assuming the C CFT is unitary, uh, which is also the same as L minus 2 bar.
Oh, wait, I don't know what happened. Okay, okay. Maybe I just accidentally touched it somehow. <laughs> ZZ bar, uh, sigma 1, sigma prime, infinity. Uh, Maybe I, I don't actually. It's dying. Yeah, yeah, it seems to be dying. It's red. That's right. That's right. The, 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 that's right. That's right. The only part that's uh, slightly non-trivial is L minus two. Yes, I now have to talk softer because this thing is more seems to be more effective. <laughs> that's okay. I don't mind talking softer. Um, um, okay. So uh, uh, okay, let me continue on the side. Um, so I'll just write down the final result for that differential equation. Uh, just so you see that it's very explicit. Um, uh, so that four point function, uh, I'll call it f of zz bar. And this differential equation you derive in this way is uh, uh, partial z squared plus three one minus two z over four z one minus z partial z minus three over sixty four z squared one minus z squared f z z bar equals zero. Now this differential equation, in fact, uh, is um, even though I derived this uh, by writing down this four point function, which four point function of sigma is supposed to obey. Uh, in fact, it should be, it should hold at level conform blocks as well. We are sort of conform blocks because everything, all the manip manipulation of the word identity will go through a level of conform blocks. Uh, so, uh, in other words, in this special case, uh, the conform blocks will have to be a solution to this different equation. So, this is holomorphic. This is another anti holomorphic equation that constrains the anti holomorphic conform block. Uh, I should emphasize again that this is, very sp this is a very special case where uh, it's only because the ex of the existence of a level 2 null state I get a second order differential equation. If you have a level 100 null state, it will have a order 100 differential equation, which would be hard to solve. Um, and in general, uh, I won't have any differential equation at all for generic weights, which is why we need that recursion relation to compute a uh, component block, the Viasora component block. In this case, it's simple enough. And there are actually two independent solutions, f plus minus of z, which are square root of 1 plus minus square root of z over z to the 1 8, 1 minus z to the 1 8. And, uh, um, and in this case, um, uh, so these two are going to be in a combination of two component blocks. Uh, two possible component blocks. Well, in fact, uh, in this case, because of the null state, uh, in the OPE uh, of sigma with sigma, only two operators could appear. One is identity, the other one is epsilon. Uh, and that's reflected 
the holomorphic part of that is reflected by the fact that here, there are only two solutions. Um, to make things better, uh, let me write uh, um, the uh, two linear combinations, which are, uh, one of them is f plus plus f minus over two. The other one is f plus minus f minus uh, without the two. And uh, this is so that the z expansion look nice. So if you expand this in power to z, you get z to the minus 1 eighth, uh, 1 plus 1 over 64, z squared plus z cubed, da, da, da. Uh, I won't write all the other terms in the z expansion. This one is equal to z to the 3 eighth uh, plus 1 plus 1 quarter, z plus 9 over 64, z squared plus da, da, da. Anyway, it's easy to compute that expansion. Um, and these precisely have the interpretation as the identity channel and the channel correspond to epsilon by matching the weights. For example, external weight is 1 16, so this is this 1 8 is twice the 1 over 16. Yes? Um, it might be a bit off topic. In three dimensional I think do we get more openings that can be uh, for first of all, here I'm organizing everything into in terms of representation of your SOAR algebra. That's w uh, that in this case, happened to be that there happens to be only a, a finite number of Verisor primaries, namely three. Uh, that's not the case for 3D Einstein model. First of all, it's global, and there were infinite many. So, so th this is very, very special. Um, but, but also, I have used the power of full Verisor. If you only use SO2, then you still find infinite many uh, uh, SO2 primaries in this um, OPE. Um, and, um, okay. Um, and now, uh, it's easy to uh, figure out, in this special case, how the conformal blocks transform under crossing. Uh, z goes to uh, 1 minus z. So you can easily check that f plus of 1 minus z turn out to be, oh, it's not it's actually entirely obvious. You have to do a few lines of high school algebra. And you'll find f plus z plus f minus z over square root 2. Uh, and f minus z is equal to f plus z minus f minus z over square two. So in this special case, actually, uh, the z goes to 1 minus z transform just reshuffles the, t the two possible component blocks into one another. Um, and uh, um, the four point function is supposed to be a contribution from the two channels. One is identity, the other one is epsilon. So uh, they come with uh, the first component block um, is uh, associated with the identity channel. F0, the 0 and 1 half indicate the internal uh, holomorphic weight. Um, the coefficient is 1, provided that I normalize the two point function to 1. Um, and uh, then there's the epsilon channel, uh, which is multiplied by the component block F1 half Z, F1 half bar Z bar. Uh, the coefficient is now non trivial because uh, over here, there's OB coefficient uh, C sigma sigma epsilon. There's another C sigma sigma epsilon over there. So I get C squared sigma sigma epsilon, the squared of one of the structure constants. And if you just check, plug in this and check, this will be invariant uh, under this crossing transform, invariance um, uniquely fix, fixes the OB coefficient. Um, C square of sigma sigma epsilon uh, to be equal to um, one quarter. In other words, this is equal to one over two up to a sign which you can absorb by the uh, normal definition of uh, the epsilon field. Okay, so uh, now that's actually a complete solution to the CFT because all the other OP coefficients are trivial. So sigma sigma one is just equal to this will be convention just equal to 1. Likewise, uh, epsilon, epsilon 1, that's also equal to 1. And uh, um, uh, by a, uh, so it turns out that uh, 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 epsilon, epsilon sigma is 0 by Z2 symmetry that reflects um, uh, sigma. Uh, and so this guy here, this sigma, sigma epsilon, is actually the only non-trivial structure constant, which we have determined by this crossing symmetry to be 1 half. And that completely solves the CFT. So this is the critical icing model, um, so known as the C equals one half uh, meal model. Ah, uh, good. Uh, so uh, I haven't, uh, of course, I haven't um, 
Uh, I, I didn't tell you, I didn't explain why these are all the alphas in, this, in the spectrum. I, I said that th there can be this three, but you can wonder, uh, maybe I can have some degeneracy of these operators and so forth. Uh, so that will actually be fixed by modular invariance. Uh, so uh, it turns out that just including one sigma and epsilon, modular invariance is satisfied, uh, which will fix the degeneracy of these operators. Uh, and, well, the, um, uh, the fact that th this, um, Sorry, the fact that this equals zero actually uh, just follow from more identity. I don't think you even need to invoke the Z2 symmetry. Is, is there another modular invariance where you could have spin one half, like H equal one half? Um, so I'm going to impose the strongest version of the modular invariance, which is invariance under, under the full uh, PSL2Z, uh, which will forbid half integer spin. So uh, I want to take the point, just to avoid you know, extra uh, uh, words I have to say. Uh, so, to, in order to insist on this uh, stronger form of the modular invariance, if I were to work with, say, a super common field theory, I have to always impose GSO projection. That, that, that's, that's the convention. Okay. Uh, now, the remaining six minutes, I'll tell you about Liville theory, um, uh, which is the uh, other uh, example I want to discuss uh, as a solution to the cross equation, but I have a feeling that I may not be able to finish. It's, all of this were supposed to be content of lecture one, but unfortunately it's taking longer than. <laughs> 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 uh, but they're, they're in the lecture notes uh, po that's, that are posted. Uh, um, <laughs> so, um, um, so uh, let me just uh, sketch the, 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 the statement. Um, uh, so sample uh, solution two uh, I want to consider consider uh, uh, a, a CFT uh, with only uh, scalar uh, zero sorrow primaries. Um, so, um, okay, I, I think I won't be able to finish this, but but l l let me go a little slower, just uh, make more sense. Uh, l let's consider. Um, uh, the partition the torus partition function to begin with, uh, just to get an idea of what the spectrum should look like. So this will be sum over uh, holomorphic and holomorphic weight of primaries, some possible degeneracy of the primaries, uh, times a partition function that sums up all the contribution from the Virasoro descendants. These are known as Virasoro characters. They're called chi h tau, chi h tilde bar tau bar, uh, where chi h of tau it's nothing but the trace of uh, 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 all the Arsoro, uh descendants of uh, this primary called new, I call it new H, uh, Q to the H minus uh, C over 24, uh, and, uh, and that was the, the torus character. So this, this whole thing is a torus partition function, uh, where Q is, uh, as usual, e to the 2 pi i tau, and uh, not the same convention as the q I used in the first half of this lecture, uh, but this is now really I'm doing this for the torus. Um, so uh, if there are no null states, if there are no null states, uh, for example, uh, if I take c squared to be greater than 1 and h to be greater than 0, uh, that would be um, uh, the case. And this is equal to q to the h minus c over 24 product equals 1 to infinity, 1 over 1 minus q to the n. Uh, this formula would fail for the uh, mu model because there are no states. Anyway. Okay. So uh, now let me uh, uh, inspect the uh, implication of uh, modular invariance. We're going we're gonna to com come, come back to uh, the crossing uh, of the sphere four-point function. But for now, let's just analyze the spectrum to see what it should look like. Uh, so, z uh, should be equal to uh, tau goes to tau plus 1, tau bar, tau bar plus 1, uh, and equal to minus 1 over tau, minus 1 over tau bar. Um, uh, if I demand this assumption, uh, then uh, this part is uh, trivially satisfied, uh, because uh, whenever h and h tilde, uh, h and h tilde are always equal in my theory, and, uh, uh, and then, then you have this combination of q, q bar to the power 
H minus C over 24. Oh, I'm also assuming that C tilde is equal to C in this case. Um, and this is always invariant, and the tau goes to tau plus 1. So this is truly satisfied. Um, but uh, uh, this one uh, is an untrivial restriction. Uh, so if you spell it out, um, you'll see that uh, Z tau tau bar is equal to, uh, I can write this in terms of the eta function. So this is actually 1 over eta tau mod squared sum over, let's say, h. I will label the degeneracy by dh, since I'm assuming h tilde to be equal to h. Uh, and then e to the minus 4 pi tau 2, h minus c minus 1 over 24. So here I'm, I've assumed that h tilde to be equal to h. Um, so and the, and the eta of tau, uh, the shift by 1 has to do with definition of eta function. And eta of tau has a modular property, eta of minus 1 over tau, is equal to square root of minus 1 minus i tau, eta of tau. And so from that, I can derive uh, uh, from that, I can derive uh, the following relation. 1 over mod tau uh, uh, some h dh e to the minus 4 pi tau 2 uh, sorry, this is the usual convention, tau is uh, tau 1 plus i tau 2, where tau 1 and tau 2 are real numbers. Tau 2 is positive. Uh, tau 2 goes to tau 2 over tau mod tau squared, uh, h minus c minus 1 over 24. Uh, this will be equal to sum over h dh e to the minus 4 pi tau 2, h minus c minus 1 over 24. Um, now this uh, looks like a funny relation. In fact, um, you see the right-hand side uh, depends only on tau 2, but the left-hand side depends on tau 1 also. So uh, this function has to be something very simple. In fact, if I define tau 2 to be x, and I define this guy to be equal to y, uh, then uh, this equation is the same as saying that uh, square root of x times sum over dh e to the 4 pi x h minus c minus 1 over 24 is equal to the same thing with x substituted by y. Th th that's what this says. Then, of course, that means that this has to be a constant. Uh, and therefore, uh, dh is completely determined by the Laplace transform of 1 over square root x. Uh, so in fact, in this, in this case, you see that dh cannot be a discrete set of values. Uh, the, well, the special cannot be discrete because the dh as a function of h has to be the Laplace transform of 1 over square root x. Um, and um, the, conclu the conclusion of this is, in fact, that dh, uh, the sum over h, will be replaced by some kind of integral uh, as a, of a special density rho h. An integral will be integrated from, uh, in this case, um, c minus 1 over 20, 24 all the way to infinity. And rho of h is some fixed function. So what we learn is that if you have a CFT whose that only contains scalar resort primaries for c greater than 1, assuming non-all states, uh, um, then, um, in fact, um, the modular invariance tells you that uh, it, has cut, it has to have a continuous spectrum, and the vacuum is actually excluded. It requires a little bit further, more, more detailed argument to, to, to see that, which I'm not spelling out to you, but it excludes, excludes the SL2 invariant vacuum. So, um, the, there's going, the spectrum is such that there's going to be a continuous spectrum of your sort primers starting at this weight all the way to infinity. Uh, so that determines the spectrum of the theory, but it doesn't yet determine the OP coefficients. And the next lecture, I'll tell you about um, uh, how the OP coefficients will be fixed by the crossing equation.